Uh, today, I want to talk about rhyme, okay? Um, a subject uh, central to the history of poetry and to much contemporary poetry, too, okay? Um, I want to begin by reading a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson called The Lady of Shalott, okay? This is an old poem Tennyson wrote in the 19th century. Um, and uh, um, pay attention to the, the end rhymes, the perfect end rhymes that you're going to hear. You won't be able to miss them because they are central here. Um, the Lady of Shalott. This is the, I'm sorry, this is just the first stanza of the poem. It's a long poem. Um, On either side the river lie, long fields of barley and of rye, that clothe the world and meet the sky, and through the field the road runs by, to many towered Camelot. The yellow-leaved water lily, the green-sheathed daffodilly, tremble in the water chilly round about Shalott. Um, so I wanted to use this poem to begin with um, because it's a great example of um, perfect end rhymes, which have, um, f you know, prior to the 20th century, um, been absolutely um, um, of, uh, you, you know, one almost wants to say primary formal importance to the way poems were written, okay? Um, the vast majority of poems used perfect end rhyme, okay? So in this poem we hear lie, rye, sky, by. These words occur at the end. Of the, of the line, right, making an end rhyme, and they are all perfect rhymes in, in the fact that lie rhymes exactly with rye, sky with by, okay, we hear water lily, daffodilly, water chili, those are exact rhymes, right, illy, 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 okay, and then the whole stanza is tied together by Camelot and um, about Shalot, right, and these, um, those, those rhymes actually repeat throughout the entire poem, okay. Um, so it's a poem that runs on, on end rhyme. Now, um, with the turn of the 20th century um, to free verse, okay, um, now that we're writing in free verse, uh, poets still rhyme, certainly, um, but they um, they introduced into their toolkit, um, and I don't, I don't want to say discovered these tools, because um, they've been around for as long as the language has, but, but they began to use um, more prominently things like slant rhyme, internal rhyme, Okay, um, and that's what I want to talk about today. Now, some of you have written poems that rhyme already, and that's great, you know, and many of them have run on, on sort of heavy um, end rhymes, and perfect end rhymes, you know, and that's fine, but many poets still employ those, right? Um, but I wanted today to try to give us kind of a, a little bit of a wider conception of what rhyme can do, the, the capacities of rhyme, okay? And hopefully that will sort of influence your practice a little bit. Um, so, um, the, 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 the sort of theme of this video, the theme that I want to talk about, um, in addition to rhyme, right, is, um, is the ability for poetic um, tools, poetic techniques um, to defy expectations, right? And, and, and um, really the, the idea that a poetic technique is only still valuable to us um, in its capacity to um, in fact, defy expectations. So, um, rhyme is really only interesting now in poetry, I think, I would argue, um, in that it can still defy expectations. And in order to do that, um, poets rely increasingly on things like slant, um, rhyme, and internal rhyme. No longer um, can we, like Tennyson did, just kind of string together some, some common rhymes, um, make it sound good, right? I mean, now, by this point, we know how to do that, right? We can do that well. What we want to do is kind of um, uh, defy people's rhyming expectations a little bit, or their expectations about rhyme by appeal to these things, okay? So let's start with, uh, with slant rhyme. Okay, um, Emily Dickinson said, tell the truth, but tell it slant, right? And um, as she um, was in most things, she was correct about this, right? Um, so slant rhyme uh, is um, when the poet rhymes uh, words that um, only sort of half rhyme, right? That, that are, are a little bit off. So either the, the, um, the, the ending consonants will rhyme or the, um, the vowel sound at the end of the word will rhyme, but not both the vowel and the consonant, right? And this is very easy to hear, okay? Um, so I want to give you an example um, from uh, Jay-Z, okay? Um, I would like you all to register how hip and relevant I'm being by, by introducing uh, hip-hop music into a poetry curriculum, okay? Whatever. Um, no. Uh, the truth is, I want to use Jay-Z because he's, he's a, he's a, um, it's a great example of, um, of slant rhyme, and he uses it extraordinarily well, as do many hip-hop artists, you know, and, and many poets, too, right? Um, or, or poets of the more traditional variety, we might say, right? Um, what I want you to pay attention to here is, is I mean, the, the thing that, that slant rhyme can really illuminate is how sort of uncannily similar certain words are 
right? I mean, it's, it's amazing how many rhymes are, are available, at least half rhymes, in the English language. And English is itself considered often to be um, a sort of rhyme-impoverished language, and then it doesn't have a lot of uh, natural rhymes. I mean, in, in Italian or, or French, you know, like half the words rhyme with each other, right? You know, it's just the nature of the language, right? Um, in English, uh, because of the, uh, the history of the English language, it's, 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 it can, it's considered a little harder to get words to rhyme, but in fact, there's, there's rhymes everywhere, you know? So, Jay-Z, this is from um, Empire State of Mind, a song, right? Um, I used to cop in Harlem all of my Dominicanos right there up on Broadway, pull me back to that McDonald's. Talk it, took it to my stash box, 560 State Street, catch me in the kitchen like a Simmons whis whipping pastry. Can't even, I can't even, you know, it's too good. Um, so, Dominicanos, McDonald's, right? That's almost, um, it's not quite, but it's almost a perfect rhyme, you know? It's, it's, still, a, it's still a slant rhyme, but, um, but it's fantastic, right? Um, uh, 560 State Street, Simmons whipping pastry, right? Um, a slant rhyme. Okay, um, and these are these are defying our expectations, right? These are bringing words together that we would not usually put together, um, and uh, they're from kind of different segments of the language. You might say McDonald's is a is a, uh, a corporate word, right? McDonald's is the name of a company, right? Name of a fast food, Dominicano, right? Is a is a nationality, right? And so to put those together, it's exciting. It's it's really exciting. We're going to talk more about that when we talk about relationships. Um, but uh, but he's fantastic. So think about using slant rhyme. You know, in fact, slant rhyme is really is excuse me is really preferable. Um, I think to to perfect rhyme. Okay, to perfect rhymes in that they're just more unusual. You know, um, no one before Jay Z had ever rhymed Dominicano and McDonald, right? Uh, and McDonald's, you know, and so um, that's that's a contribution to the history of poetry, right? To be able to do that, you know, it's 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 very exciting. So it defies expectations. So slant rhyme. Good, all right? Um, internal rhyme here. Um, this is the case when um, one word rhymes with another, um, but they're not necessarily at the end of the line, okay? Um, so um, turning to your textbook here, I want to look at one of the poems that you're going to read for class today, um, The Old Cosmologist by K. Ryan on page 532. And K. Ryan is a master of the um, the internal rhyme and of, of slant rhyme generally. Um, just the first couple lines here. Um, when their cosmology grows soft and spongy and unreal, the old cosmologists get touchy. They feel they should have held it off, they should have known about it in advance, they should have stretched the interstellar cloth or sewn a row of stars along a rift just to the left of Mars or guessed about a pin-sized patch of purple gas. Okay, you could, I could read the whole poem. Um, it's uh, just two sentences, I think. Um, pretty, pretty remarkable. But... Um, uh, Consider these these internal rhymes here. We have um, uh, let's see, cosmology and spongy. Those are actually um, not internal rhymes. Those are slant end rhymes, right? But then we have what we have: um, spongy and touchy, right? Um, internal and slant, right? Um, we have uh, they feel and unreal. Okay. Um, Grow soft and spongy and unreal. The old cosmologists get touchy. They feel, okay? So feel comes at the end of the line, but unreal um, was in the middle of a previous line here, okay? Now, the effect of these in internal rhymes, and you notice this when you're reading, especially when you're reading out loud, and that's part of the reason I want you to be reading these poems out loud, um, is that you you sort, of, um, you sort of, it's a surprise kind of chiming of the words. You know, you'll read a word, and you'll just, you know, pass over it, and then all of a sudden, three lines later, another word will kind of chime with it, and, and you'll hear it. You know, and it's really cool. It's like these little little harmonies that are kind of interspersed in the in the main melody of the poem. It's 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 pretty remarkable um, if it's used well. Okay, um, so in your own poems, try and and use internal rhyme, right? Um, and the the other advantage of internal rhyme, of course, is that it doesn't bind you to a stanzaic structure, right? It doesn't um, force you to use couplets that end it, that have rhymes at the end of each word. It doesn't force you to use um, a specific rhyme scheme. Okay. Um, it's useful. You can you can use um, all of the, um, the you can make use of all the advantages of free verse and still have that element of rhyme if you're relying on internal rhyme and slant rhyme as well. Okay. Um, the third tool here is is not um, it's not a, uh, a a rhyming innovation like slant rhyme or internal rhyme, um, but it's a way to think about about rhymes and that's um, considering the relationship um, between two words. 
when they rhyme, okay? McDonald's, Dominicanos. The, the type of words they are, the meaning of the word. So not only is rhyme a tool for, um, for sound, but it's also a tool for meaning. In much the same way that the line break is also a formal sound tool, it's also, hey, a music or a, a, a meaning sense tool as well. Same thing with rhyme, okay? Um, so when you rhyme two words, um, the act of doing so as a poet is saying, hey, there is a relationship between these two words, okay? Um, and that may not seem totally obvious, but it's the case, okay? Um, even in, um, you know, uh, Tennyson's Lady of Shalott poem, right? Every time he rhymed, he was saying, well, okay, there's something, there's a relationship between water lily, daffodilly, you know, water chili. Even water chili is grouped in into that, into that group there, okay? Um, rhymes have the power of, of creating really almost near metaphors. You know, you're saying, hey, there's a relationship between the word, these words. They're either like each other. They're either unlike each other. Um, they are thematically related to the poem in some way. Okay? Um, it's, a, it's a metaphorical thematic effect. So let's go back to Jay-Z for an example. Um, later on in, uh, in the song Empire State of Mind, he says, Hail Mary to the city, you're a virgin, and Jesus can't save you. Life starts when the church ends. Okay, um, or when church ends, or something like that. So, um, virgin, church end, church end, virgin. Okay, they are um, they are ever so slightly slant, right? Um, uh, they are ever so slightly connected by by sound, um, and by doing so, Jay Z is saying, well, hey, there's there's some kind of relationship between these these two words, and indeed, um, virgin and church end, well, those are thematically related, you know, um, sort of by, by grouping those together, you're calling up a whole code of, you know, um, uh, Christian um, tradition, and, um, and uh, you know, I mean, it's truly, right? I mean, it's, there, there are two words that are heavily indebted to the, to the Christian tradition, and by grouping them together, he's saying, hey, let's consider these briefly, you know, or at least that's how we reread the poem if we are reading it on paper as opposed to hearing it, you know. Um, in the song, it's primarily geared toward, you know, the, the sound, and it's a great sound, but, um, but if we were really, I mean, if we were really putting pressure on this language, then we would have to consider that, okay? And, and you're going to find this in every poem that rhymes, you're going to find instances of this. When the poet rhymes two words that he wants the reader to kind of consider closely as either opposites or as somehow related or as similar, you know, in um, the 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 different kinds of relationships are are you know um, almost infinite the in the the relationships that can be applied, um, but uh, but they're there. So the most ex most common example is kind of the um, the uh, breath death you know, rhyme, you know, two very common words that are um, very commonly rhymed. It's kind of a dead rhyme, in fact, that it's been used so often. It no longer defies our expectations. But once, I mean, can you consider what it would be like to be the first person to have rhymed breath and death, you know, to say, oh, breath, breath, the sign of life. Oh my gosh, it rhymes with death, you know, and to, and to, and to put those two words together in a poem that had to be so powerful. You know, now when we do it, it's like, well, you know, duh. You know, um, that's been done many, many times before. But it's sort of the same thing with putting, you know, Virgin or Church End or Dominicanos and McDonald's together, right? Um, you're saying, hey, there's, there's, something, there's something here between these two words, okay? And that's what I want you to think about when you use rhyme. So um, not only using slant rhyme, not only using internal rhyme, in fact, using those more than you would perfect end rhyme, but also thinking about the relationships between words. So thinking about it on the, on the um, sound level and also the sense level. That's what I want you to do. I'm going to ask you in, um, uh, for today's assignment to do a little exercise where you, um, uh, I'm forcing you to, to you employ some rhyme in, in writing a couple lines, you know. And, uh, um, and even if you're not planning on, on rhyming um, in, uh, in the poems you turn in for your portfolio, I hope that you, you take this opportunity to kind of consider some of the, um, the great opportunities, right, um, that, that rhyme can afford you in poetry. Okay, guys? Um, so good luck on the, uh, on the assignment. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, I hope these third poems um, that are due on this Friday are going well. Um, and I just want to reiterate that, you know, um, feel free to send me any, any other questions you have about the course. Um, we're going to be talking about the portfolio, um, obviously, because that's going to be due at the end of next week, right, at the end of class. Um, so we're gearing up for that. Um, but, but if anything is, um, if you have any issues about the class, please send me an email, um, and we can hash those out before, uh, before next week. Okay, guys. Great.